I talked to a couple of people and they believe that the greens have actually gotten a little softer over the years and they're not as, as penal and not rolling out as they have been over the last, say, you know, 10, 15 years. I wouldn't say that out loud if I was playing in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not playing, so I'm good. This season of Half Forgotten History, we're partnering with Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans. I love the Sprinter van. It's always a smooth ride, whether I'm headed to the course to play around or to the stadium for a really good tailgate. And just like the world-class athletes we talked to on the show, Mercedes-Benz Sprinter vans go the extra mile. Hey everybody, what's up? Trey Wingo here, and welcome into season three of Half Forgotten History. We're delighted to be with you again. As you can tell, Spring has finally sprung on the East Coast, and we're excited to be partnering with Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans for Season 3. Got mine right here behind me. Probably as soon as we're done here, I'm going to go hit the course. Actually, that's a lie. I'm definitely going to hit the course after we're done with this, and that's the theme of Season 3. It's all about two great spring traditions, the Masters and the NFL Draft. And we have guests for you lined up that you are going to love, including... Our inaugural episode in Season 3 right here with a former Masters champion who once told me, I can't believe I won the damn tournament the day after he won the damn tournament. None other than 2008 Masters champion and now CBS broadcaster Trevor Immelman. So Trevor, as a former Masters champion, how weird is it to think that we're going to play two of these within five months of each other? We had one in November, obviously, because it was postponed, and now we're having the regular stop in 2021 in April. It's, uh, it's definitely different. Um, you know, I know when, when I was growing up falling in love with the game uh, in South Africa, you would kind of set your schedule as a fan watching golf uh, with the Masters. At least that's what we did down there because we weren't getting all the tournaments on TV. That was always such a big deal for me growing up. Uh, and now, as you say, to have two in the space of six months, uh, it's pretty cool. It's it's got to be like a dream come true for all of us golf fans and 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 even the players that get to compete. Uh, the other thing is that I think players that were rookies in November, playing in their first Masters, they now in a very short space of time get another go at it, and they're going to have bagged that experience that they received the first time around in November. And all those memories will be quite fresh for them. So that might be something for us to uh, keep an eye on as, as the tournament gets going. That's interesting, though, because we talked a little bit before the November Masters. And, and I remember you were very adamant about how different the course was going to play based on the winds and the temperature, which actually mm -hmm. wasn't too bad. But just the, the normal weather patterns in November in Augusta are very different than they are in April. You know, from a weather standpoint, I think what happened the week before the tournament uh, in November, they got so much rain yeah. and the golf course was so soft, really softer than I had ever seen it. And so, you know, a lot of those whole locations that ordinarily, you know, as fans, we're so used to being so fiery and so quick around the hole uh, and players not able to get that close to certain hole locations. That wasn't really the case in November. Players were, were able to really play aggressively. And I think it showed up in the scoring. Dustin Johnson setting the scoring record. And then for the first time ever, the guy who finished second, Cameron Smith, first guy ever to shoot four rounds in the 60s at the Masters. So I think, uh, you know, the course turned out, played a little easier than what it does in April. You know, when we first spoke about it, I thought that maybe we could get some really cold days and then the course could play really long, maybe get a, uh, some wind to really throw the guys off their game. But once the tournament got going in November and that front had moved through, they had some really nice warm weather and they were able to just uh, play quite freely knowing that the course just wasn't quite as fiery as it ordinarily is. Yeah, I talked to a couple of people, and they believe that the greens have actually gotten a little softer over the years, and they're not as, as penal and not rolling out as they have been over the last, say, you know, 10 or 15 years. I wouldn't say that out loud if I was playing in the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not playing, so I'm good. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I, you know, Augusta National is a magical place, and they have the ability to dial that golf course up pretty much the way they want particularly in April. Yeah. And so, 
you know, what's going to be very interesting for me to uh, observe during the, the practice rounds and then as the tournament gets underway in a couple of weeks, will there be some adjustments to really send a message and have the course play a lot tougher than what we've seen maybe in years past? Now, after we, we saw the scoring record from DJ in November, they, they may want to just uh, send a message that uh, the course still can stand up and, and show some teeth. So that, that's going to be fun for me to watch. Apparently, uh, the conditions and the weather in prep has been ideal for them. Uh, listening to some sound from Lee Westwood, who was up there last Monday playing with his son, he said the course was as firm and fast and as difficult as he had ever seen it. And um, so, uh, you know, that kind of lets us give it one of these. Looking forward to the week. Absolutely. And before we get into your victory in 2008, I, I do want to sort of go back to something you touched on. You said, uh, you know, the Masters was something as a South African player that you sort of set your calendar to because you didn't get all the majors. Mm -hmm. Was the Masters, like, is, was that the thing that drew you into golf? Was that the thing that sort of made you want to be a part of it? Yeah, it was absolutely the thing that drew me uh, into the game of golf. The Open Championship, uh, obviously, is uh, the oldest championship and an incredible event. Uh, that was well uh, covered and represented in, in, down in South Africa at that time uh, when I was growing up. Let's call this uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. But the Masters, I remember so clearly 1986. I'm six years old. It's the first time that I see the Masters on television. I'm begging my parents to stay up late because, you know, it's 11 o'clock, midnight, one in the morning because of the time change. You know, back in those days, only the second nine was televised. Correct. And so you would wait and, you know, the first shots you would see of the day would be guys sling hooking it around the corner down 10. And that event, I've got goosebumps talking about it right now. You know, you've got a 46-year-old Jack Nicholas who everyone is saying is past his prime. You've got Seve, Norman, Tom Kite, the best of the best are coming down the stretch there. Jack creates one of the greatest upsets maybe even in sport, maybe one of the greatest sporting achievements as a 46-year-old when everybody had written him off to win his sixth green jacket. And that absolutely was the thing and the catalyst for me to be like, man, that is what I want to do. That, that looks really cool. That's interesting to me because obviously South Africa has such a great history of great golfers, including a, mm. a three-time Masters champion in Gary Player, but obviously, mm. that was well before you were involved in the game or in the world in any way, shape, or form. So it was Jack more than Gary that sort of gave you your love for Augusta. In that moment, yes. Yeah. And that's because that's what, that was what I saw right then. And at that time, Gary wasn't quite playing at that same level to where he had an opportunity to win another major championship. His last Masters win was in 1978. Correct when he was 42 years old, which is incredible in its own right. But that moment watching Jack win and just the excitement of, him, of it, the excitement of him making the eagle at 15, making the birdie at 16 and 17, and then the long two putt up the hill on 18. Uh, it, it was, I was just so drawn in. Um, but then, you know, on the back of that, knowing everything that Gary achieved in the game, uh, having the opportunity uh, to meet him as a, as a young kid. I actually met him when I was five years old. He was doing an exhibition in our hometown. And so it, it's kind of like a culmination of those things. But that, that, those things are absolutely the catalyst as to me falling in love, in love with the game and, and wanting to do everything that I possibly could to, to get over to the U.S. and, and play in the Masters and, and play in the biggest events. So if I'm hearing you, you met Gary Player when you were five. You That's stayed right. up to watch Jack when you were six. Clearly, right. you picked up the game at a very, very early age. How did that happen? Yeah, you know, got an older brother who was going into high school. And uh, the high school that he went to offered golf as a sport, uh, which really, to be very honest with you, is extremely unusual in South Africa back then. Um, rugby and cricket, massive sports. Soccer, massive sport down there. And so golf at the time wasn't quite as big. And he decided to go ahead and, and give that a shot. And so I just followed him out to the golf course. 
and I fell in love with it instantaneously. Um, we were very fortunate to, to grow up near a golf course, probably five or 10 minute drive away. And back then, you know, there really weren't many private golf courses in South Africa at all. I had so much opportunity to get out and just go and play golf at great golf courses within a half an hour drive of my house. Uh, just, just pay to play. We became members at the local golf course, Somerset West Country Club, and I just used to go there straight from school. I used to go there every single day. I would, I would, I would uh, you know, as I got older and, and into what we call primary school, you know, I'd pack my mother's car in the morning. My dad would take me uh, to school. And then my mom would pick me up from school and just take me straight to the golf course. And I would get changed there and practice all afternoon. And then my dad would pick me up on his way home from work, normally kind of around six o'clock at night. You know, inevitably, I'd be out on the golf course trying to get a few extra holes in before the sun went down. And he would walk out there and, and watch us play a few holes. It was a great junior program, a lot of great juniors and, and amateurs at, at the club at the time. And it was just, honestly, the best possible way to grow up, man. I had just the greatest childhood from that standpoint, being able to um, have access to great facilities, a nice golf course, good competition around the area. And I just, I lived for it. It's, it's all, it's the only thing that consumed me was how quick could I get back to the golf course to, uh, to be able to play and practice. In fact, I was so obsessed with it that I convinced my father to build a green in, in a bunker in our front yard. Okay. That had to be quite a convincing speech. <laughs> Dad, I want to dig up the front yard and put a sand pit in there. <laughs> I think, you know, fortunately, when I told them as a youngster that I wanted to be a pro golfer, they believed me. You know, it wasn't yeah. like normally when kids come up to their parents and they want to be a fireman or a pilot or whatever, you know, the the first few attempts, parents were like, okay, that's great. My parents believed me and they went all in on it. And they gave me every opportunity that they could afford at the time. But yeah, so he built this, this, this chipping and putting green bunker and I would just be out there, out there, out there. And eventually I was like, okay, here's the next problem. There's, there's not enough hours in the day. So here's what I need now. Now I need a floodlight. Okay, <laughs> so that I can practice at night. This, so, this is obsession. This is yeah, borderline obsession. You have no idea. So, you know, you got, you got to love my dad. Put a floodlight out there. And, uh, we would have a little switch behind the TV and I'd go and click it on and the, the whole yard would, would light up. Neighbors must have hated me, uh, particularly because I was using their backyards to hit balls from over the walls and fences and roads and stuff to get onto the green. You were unstoppable. And, uh, so it was just the apps best. I was consumed with golf, fell in love with the game. Well, it sounds like then winning the Masters was the absolute dream major for you to win. So why don't we take a break here when we come back more with Trevor Immelman about how it went down in 2008 at Augusta and more importantly, what else was happening in golf at the time? Because I don't think that should be discounted as part of the story. Coming right back with more of Trevor Immelman after this. This episode is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans. With options like Blind Spot Assist and Active Lane Keeping Assist, plus MBUX Voice Command technology for directions, weather forecast, comfort control, and more, Mercedes-Benz can be ready to go the extra mile. I use it every time I head to the golf course. The handling is amazing, the ride is smooth, and trust me, you never run out of space. Thanks again to Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans. All right, back with Trevor Immelman on this episode of Half Forgotten History, episode one of season three. We're going the extra mile in season three, thanks to our friends at Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans. And from South Africa, you have to go the extra mile to get to Augusta and play at the Masters. So going into the tournament of the championship in 2008, how good did you think, how well did you think you were playing? Did you feel like I'm clicking on all cylinders or were you a little nervous about your game? It's a funny story. Sure. It's actually a, 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 it's a, it's a weird story. If you give me a couple of minutes on this. Sure. I started playing, I'd started playing really well, like 05, 06, 07. And, you know, I was in the top 15 in the world. So was kind of finding my way in the, uh, at the highest level. And toward the end of 2007, I won a big tournament down in South Africa, the Nedbank Challenge. 
shortly after started feeling some pain in my uh, abdomen. And eventually it turned out I had a tumor on my diaphragm. So I had to have this thing moved. I had to stay in South Africa a lot longer than I anticipated. And so it pushed back uh, the start of my 08 season. And it had been a slow start because the way they had to get this tumor out was there six inch incision in my back. And so I was a little bit apprehensive when I started back. I wasn't quite willing to swing at full capacity, particularly when the ball was in the rough. Uh, and it was, it was in my mind. So by the time that the masters had started rolling around, I started feeling a little bit more comfortable with being able to put the practice in and get ready. I just had to find a way to start making some putts. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, did I think that I had what it takes? Yeah, sure I did, but it was gonna need something special and I needed to get off to a good start. And that's what, that's what happened for me. I, I, I made a few putts early on on Thursday. I went out in two under uh, 34 on the opening nine. And the confidence just sort of started building from there. Shot a 68 on Thursday and uh, led all the way through from that moment on. That had to be oddly comforting and weird at the same time, right? Because normally we see these massive fluctuations, especially at majors, first round leaders. And maybe a lot of times that translates into the second round. And then when it's Saturday and moving day, things tend to fall back. But the fact that you were sort of there from Thursday on, when did you sort of understand the mantle of what you were carrying? It was probably Saturday night. Uh, you know, Thursday, you make, the, uh, you know, shoot 68. And I was leading. And that felt great. Uh, and then, you know, still in the back of the, your mind, you're like, okay, look, anything can happen here. So you want to shoot a good round Friday, make sure you make the cut and keep yourself in position for the weekend. Went out and shot another good round Friday. So now we're still leading Saturday playing in the final group. We had a long uh, weather delay, two hour delay. So we finished the third round in the dark uh, playing with Brent Snedeker. I birdied the last hole uh, to give myself a two shot lead going into Sunday. And by the time we had uh, finished all the media and all that stuff after the third round, I probably only left the course just after 9 p.m. You know, I'll never forget I, driving out Magnolia Lane, turn my phone on, um, and messages are coming in from all over the world. One of the first voice messages I received is from Gary Player. And he was just like so stern with me. He, you know, he was like, Trevor, I played a practice round with him on the Tuesday. Um, and he was like, uh, you're playing so well, but you've got to be ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be so tough. Adversity is going to come. And there will be a moment when you're going to have to decide. Like, I'm either going to hang in there now or I'm just going to fade away like so many have. Because in those moments, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't really even feel in control of your body. I mean, there's, there's just so much nerves and adrenaline and excitement and anxiety. It's all rolled into one and you're trying to deal with all of it. And uh, he was absolutely right. And that, and that did happen on the Sunday. But, but after that call, it really kind of sobered me up after the third round. Because I sat back and thought to myself, you know, this could be, this could be the best chance that I ever have to win a major. Heck, it might be the only chance. You know, you have to remember that back in those days, Tiger was beating up on everybody so often and so much that there, there weren't many others to go around. So I knew I, immediately I had to take advantage of it. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I have in front of me Tiger's record from 2000 through 2010 mm. at Augusta. 2000, <laughs> fifth. 2001 and 2002, winner, winner. 2003, tie 15. 2004, T 22. 2005, winner. 2006, T 3. 2007, T 2. 2008, your year two. 2009, T 6. 2010, 
T4. I mean, this was at a time, like, you won a major, and specifically the Masters, when Tiger was gobbling up Masters and Majors like stone kids are eating ice cream at a dorm on campus. Like, <laughs> does, d- did that sort of, like, give you an extra credence? Like, I beat the dude when the dude was the dudest dude of all time. Yeah, look, it's something I look back on now and appreciate much more uh, now that I'm sort of, you know, a little bit more removed from the playing aspect. Um, you know, I hope this doesn't sound too arrogant, but at the time, you know, we all realized his greatness and, and how he was able to do stuff that we knew we couldn't do. But in a certain sense, you've got to lie to yourself in the moment and try and make yourself believe that you sure. are able to compete. Otherwise, what's the point? I mean, we all want to win. It's why we've uh, dedicated our lives, sacrificed a lot of different things to try and have that opportunity to achieve what we've always wanted to achieve. So in the moment when you're playing and you're in your, your mid-20s, you are convincing, trying to convince yourself in every single moment possible that you are able to hang with this guy. You know, I think on that Sunday, the thing that really helped me was reverse back two years, 2006, uh, when I won for the first time on the PGA Tour at the West Western Open. Open. Yeah. He finished second. That was like the first experience that I had of going uh, head to head with him. And uh, he was in the group in front of me that day uh, and also had an amazing record in that tournament and at that golf course. And it, it was definitely something that I wasn't used to because the crowds and the spectators were so rowdy and so in his corner and, you know, heckling me and letting me know exactly where he stood and that he had just made a birdie and that he's going to beat me and that I'm going to choke. And it was really one of the first times that I had experienced, um, you know, how motivated and excited his fans are. Uh, And it was a lot of fun. You know, once again, that kind of pulls back to the Gary player thing. Like in that moment, you, you can either get intimidated and be like, oh, shucks, this is not quite for me. Or you carry it as a chip on your shoulder and you say, okay, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I think I've got game. I've, I know that I've put the work in and I'll play. And, uh, you know, no matter how, what, what you say to me and how well he plays, I'll play as well as what I can and we'll see what can happen. And I was fortunate enough that day uh, to win that tournament, my first win on the PGA Tour. And so I, I drew on that quite a bit. Uh, on that Sunday at Augusta. It's interesting you say that because mental perspective on something like that is something that people don't talk about a lot. And for example, when Tiger uh, was winning everything in 2000 and like he was having trouble dealing with Bob May at the 2000 PGA Championship, people forgot like Bob May was the guy that Tiger sort of looked up to in junior golf in Southern California. So in everyone else's minds, Tiger in 2000 was the greatest golfer and the greatest thing anyone was ever seen in golf. But to Bob May, he's that kid I used to beat all the time. And I think that's why Mm. Bob wasn't surprised that the PGA Championship in 2000 was such a close contest, but everyone else was because to your point, he was relying on his memories. I used to beat this guy all the time. This is no big deal. Well, let me tell you something. I've played a lot of golf with Bob May when I was coming through on the European tour, he was over there playing full time. And so I knew exactly how good he was. Um, uh, Just a great player, really gutsy. And like you said, had an amazing junior and amateur career. And yeah, I mean, it's one of those moments as an athlete that you definitely know. I mean, they, they are, they're superstars. Okay. Like the Tiger Woods and Jordans and LeBrons and Steph Curry's of the world. Um, and, and Brady's and Chuck's, you know, we, we, we all know the superstars. Right. And then there's others that are good. And I, and I you know, you throw, I, I put myself in this category, others that are good, but you've got to find, you're not going to have that many opportunities to, to prove that you've got what it takes to win on the highest level. But when those opportunities come, you better be ready and you better be willing to, you know, maybe even at times, you know, do it ugly but win. I was very, very aware of the fact that this might be the only chance that I get to win a major championship or my best chance to win a major championship. Unfortunately, I was right in that thing. But also, fortunately, 
I was able to get it done on that Sunday. And it's something that, you know, I'm very proud of, massively humbled by. I mean, every time I go back to Augusta National or do something like, like we're doing right now and I'm able to, to speak about it, it, there's still a part of me that, is, that cannot believe that I, I, I won the Masters. Well, I'm glad you, you used that phrase specifically because we had you on uh, radio and ESPN uh, the Monday after the Masters. I was filling in in the morning and I asked you a question. I said, what went through your mind as soon as you knew you had won the green jacket? And you gave me one of the greatest answers I've ever heard from anybody. Do you remember what it was? No, what was that? You just blurted out, I can't believe I won the damn tournament. <laughs> <laughs> I still feel like that. What are we about 13 years later? I still, yeah. can't, I still can't believe it at times. And when you, you know, when we go back every year and, uh, you know, now, like you, like you said, we go back twice in six months and you sit at that champion's dinner and you kind of lean back and observe the room and see everybody who's in the room. It's a surreal moment. It's a surreal moment uh, that, you know, in a, in a certain sense, like your career, well, for me, my career sort of flashes past, you know, this, this young kid that fell in love with the game growing up in, in, you know, the southern tip of Africa, fortunate enough to, to see the Masters on TV as a six-year-old and, and, and fall in love with the game. And then, you know, lucky enough to be able to get out there and play and, and have parents that can kind of help me along. Uh, the fact that Obviously, there's, there's, there's valleys in, you know, throughout the career as well. But the fact that you can kind of make your way through to, to that, winning the Masters, when it was just a dream, when you're this little, little kid, it's, um, it's pretty special. And now that career has taken a different path, but it continues to be focused around the Masters. You're part of the CBS crew that'll be there. Why don't we take another break here? When we come back, we'll talk about what Trevor thinks are expectations for this year's 2021 Masters. Stay with me. You know, here on Half Forgotten History, we love talking to the legends in the game about the stories behind some of their most rewarding moments, sometimes in the biggest game possible. And when you're off the field, well, you want to be rewarded as well. So if you're looking for a credit card that fits your lifestyle, look no further. U.S. Bank has credit cards that make every day rewarding, no matter what you're into. For example, you feeling hungry? Well, check out the U.S. Bank Altitude Go Visa Signature Card. Earn four times points on takeout, food delivery, and dining, and get two times points at gas stations, grocery stores, and on streaming. That'll keep your wallet and your mouth full. Big spender? Well, the U.S. Bank Visa Platinum Card has a low intro APR for large purchases or balance transfers. And you call the shots with the U.S. Bank Cash Plus Visa Signature Card. Choose two categories each quarter. Earn 5% back on your first $2,000 of eligible purchases from those categories. So don't just get a credit card. Get the right card to make every day more rewarding. Cash back, merchandise, travel rewards, and low intro APRs are waiting. Learn more at usbank.com slash credit card. The creditor and issuer of these cards is U.S. Bank National Association, pursuant to a license from Visa USA Incorporated. And the cards are available to U.S. residents only. Some restrictions may apply. Member FDIC. 68 teams started the tournament, but only four have survived. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting new customers in the center of the action. Bet $1 on any tournament game, and if your team wins, you win $100. It's literally that simple. There's no better way to put your college basketball knowledge to the test than to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. I went to Baylor. Baylor is in the Final Four for the first time since, well, 71 years ago. So, of course, I'm riding with my Baylor Bears all the way. That's where I'm putting my money with my Baylor Bears. So make sure you download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the promo code TREY when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 if the college basketball team of your choosing pulls off the win. That's code TREY to turn $1 into $100 for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only, and new customers only. Restrictions do apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. And if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. All right, back here on Half Forgotten History with Trevor Immelman, the 2008 Masters Champion. So now we're heading back to Augusta again for the second time in less than six months. 
What are your expectations about, A, how the course will play, and then we'll get into who do you think uh, might be there putting on a green jacket when it's all said and done. So what are your expectations on the setup, as you said earlier, based on the scoring record we saw in November? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm hoping it'll be different. Um, I'm hoping that uh, they don't get too much rain and that they're really able to get the course really firm and fast. I just think there's something so exciting about watching the best players in the world compete on a golf course where so much happens while the ball is on the ground and rolling. And so what I mean by that is, you know, all these false edges and ridges and stuff on the green, just miss the green in the wrong spot and the ball rolls off 25 feet and you're left with a very difficult two or you're trying to go at that back right corner there down the hill on the par three sick, which is the size of a coffee table and a gust of wind comes up and this ball pitches, you know, two yards right of the green and kicks down and player makes a double bogey from there. Like, I think it gets so exciting when it's firm and fast, you really start to see how skillful the best players in the world are and how good they are at controlling um, not only the distance, but the trajectory and the spin on the golf ball. That's what I'm always hoping for when we get to the biggest tournaments. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping for, for not too much rain leading up to the tournament and we can really get it firm and fast. It seems like what you're describing is, is much more of a European style of play because so much of the American style of play is put the ball in the air. And there's so much, like you said, when the ball's on the ground at Augusta, so many different things that can change. It's, it's funny. I, I, I just keep waiting for Rory to finally get yep. that green jacket because it, when he does, he'll complete the career grand slam. And it was in 2011 where he stood on that 10th tee with, I think, a three or four stroke lead and then hit it off the 10th tee to a place I had never seen on the golf course before. And that sort of began the unraveling for him. Where do you see his chances in maybe pulling it off this year? Oof, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, in 2011, South Africans were the beneficiary of the bad tee shot. Correct. Charles Schwartzel. Charles Absolutely. To win and become the third South African to win the Masters. So that was exciting for us, but always tough to see, you know, an athlete have to go through what Rory went through, particularly at such a young, vulnerable age, you know, not quite hardened yeah. uh, through years of professional sports yet. Uh, but now... But, it, but it, bothered, it bothered him so much, he went on to win the next major That's, and set a record at Congressional. So yeah, he, was, he seemed fair okay enough. with it. Fair enough. Now look at him. Four majors in, going to be a Hall of Famer. You know, I think he's won like 17 or 18 times here on the PGA Tour and, you know, lots of wins around the world as well. It's an interesting time, though, because he hasn't won a major in, in quite a few years. And even though he's had a lot of wins, that Grand Slam, it just puts you in a whole nother level, you know, on the golfing totem pole. You know, we've got a couple guys that are close there. We've got Spieth, who needs the PGA. We've got Mickelson who needs the U.S. Open, and then we've got Rory at the Masters. And you just can't think that there's a better fit than Rory McIlroy at Augusta National. You know, you just get the feeling that that course is tailor-made for him. But, you know, in his own words, he's been struggling a little bit with his game and yeah. with his swing and seems uncomfortable. He's hired a new coach now in Pete Cowan, and they started work this week. Didn't look very good yesterday uh, when I no. watched him competing in the first round of the match play. Hit a number of tee shots that are so unusual. Normally one of the best drivers in the game. And uh, that wasn't even behaving. He put so, it in a pool. He put it in a pool. I, it's, not, it's not always bad being near a pool, but you don't want your golf ball <laughs> in the pool. Um, so, yeah, I think it's an interesting time for him. Um, knowing also, I'm sure he puts a little extra pressure on himself going, to the Masters because he knows he should win there. He knows it's, it's to complete the career Grand Slam. But if I try and look at it from a positive standpoint, maybe knowing that he's not playing his best new coach, maybe the expectations go down for him right. personally. And if that he comes into the tournament, maybe being a little friendlier to himself, cutting himself some slack, taking his foot off the gas just a little bit. And then maybe he can find a little sweet spot there. Because nobody who watches the game of golf 
doubts that you know if he gets his tail up and he gets a little momentum earlier, the guy's clearly got what it takes to win anywhere at any time. So he just needs that little bit of secret sauce, that little bit of little bit of confidence. And uh, you know, it'll, it, can you imagine how exciting that'd be? Coming down the stretch on Sunday, if he's got a chance to not only win his first green jacket, but complete the career grand slam. It would be way up there in terms of what, what golf fans would mm. be looking for. And then there's DeChambeau, who yeah. basically before the 2020 basically said, well, all the par fives are par fours for me. But did that come back to bite him? Obviously, length is becoming much more of a big deal at Augusta mm. because what they've done to the golf course. But what do you think he learned from last year that he can sort of apply and change going into this year's Masters? I hope he learned that you don't always want that much distraction and chaos around as you're yeah. about to compete in an event that's very important to you. You know, he sure was the talk of the town. There's no doubt about it. Great win at Wingfoot, gets his first major. He then starts talking about tinkering with a 48-inch driver. Everyone's going nuts about how far he's hitting it. And what concerned me was that he came to Augusta National still not knowing which driver he was going to use. And right up until the Wednesday, the day before the tournament starts, he's still testing a 45-inch driver and a 48-inch driver. You know, that may work for him. We've seen that his practice schedules and routines are quite different. You know, the guy will practice into the night when leading a tournament, into the dark when he's leading a tournament different. on Saturday night. He's definitely, he's definitely different. different. You know, I just feel like that was a step too far, though, just to, to, to have that distraction and, and get out there. And, and the reason you don't want that distraction is, let's say that he, he ended up going with the 45-inch because he thought that the 48 was spinning too much. Right. So you go with the 45, and let's say you hit a bad tee shot on number two or number five, and then all of a sudden you start to doubt, well, should I go on with the 48? Have I made a mistake? And all it does is it takes your attention away from the things that really matter. And if you had cleaned all of that up pre-tournament, now you don't have to worry about that. And so that's the one thing that I hope that he would have learned out of that is, is to just come to the tournament not having to be concerned too much with equipment and so that he can spend more time on the greens. Because the green complexes at Augusta National, as everybody knows, are very difficult, undulating, tricky, fast and they don't have the use of green books at Augusta National, which is something right. that he loves to use week in and week out on the tour. And so I think if I was in his team, I would say, dude, you got to invest double the amount of time putting this week. Make sure you're extremely comfortable on the greens because he is a great putter. And if he can he find is. a way to putt great at Augusta National, you know, he is a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a real problem. He's a real problem for the best players in the world. Because they know that the advantage that he has with power. Well, look, I'll, he didn't win the players, but I'll never forget he was trying to hole out from the fairway on 18 to get into a playoff, and he hit a wedge 185 yards, a pitching wedge, <laughs> 185 yards. Like, like People are like, oh, he didn't hole out. I'm like, hold on. He just hit a pitching wedge that was past mm -hmm. the flag at 185 yards. I feel like we're, we're sort of glossing over that. A lot of people also glossed over the fact that he had a five iron off the tee, Trey. Yeah, You know, he said that he cracked his four iron on the tee shot on the fourth, yeah. uh, or the, shall I say the third, after he topped it into that uh, water there. And so didn't hit it again. And he actually hit a five iron off the tee on 18, which is just, whew, he, he, I mean, it's incredible what he's done with his body in the last 18 months and the way that he has transformed his game and, and added all of this club head speed without losing the integrity of his swing. Yeah. Um, man, my hat, my hat goes off to him and his team. A brilliant group of people working together there. You're right, because we've had mashers before, but what Bryson has done better is he's a masher who finds plenty of fairways. Like, that. like oh, we've yeah. had guys that are always longer, but he's longer and putting the ball where it needs to be. Okay, mm -hmm. we, you've been very generous with your time. We appreciate it. I love the masters. You love masters. So before we let you go, let's do this. Let's see how far back mm -hmm. we can go and remember all the champions. You ready? Oh. Oh, wow. Okay. 2020, obvious, Dustin Johnson. Yeah. 2019, obvious, right? Um, Tiger. Tiger, 2018. Uh, Reed, is it That's Reed? Correct, 2017. Yes. Was Sergio. Correct, 2016. Was Danny Willett. 
you're on fire. So that means 2015 was? Uh, why can't I remember 2015? Well, he's the reason Danny Willett won in 2016. Oh, Spieth. That's right. There, Spieth, there you Spieth. go. And then Spieth hit it in the water on 12. That's right. On 12. Spieth. More than once. Okay, so 2014. 14. Was that Bubba? Bubba, correct. 2013. Okay. Well, Bubba won it in 12 and 14. Yes. So who's correct. 13? Oh, the other, the other country that's not American that loves the Masters. Oh, Adam Scott. How can I forget Boom. Adam Scott? There you How go. All right. That? So oh, you got 2012. Yes. I, oh, I'm, I'm going to make sure he sees it. Um, <laughs> so, okay. You, you already mentioned Bubba in 2012. You know who 2011 is. Who's 2011? We just talked about it. The beneficiary of Rory's bad tee shot. Oh, yeah, Schwartzel. That's right. So, no, Why he's really going to kill you. He's really. Yeah. Adam may Schwarzel. kill you. Schwartzel's going to destroy you for that. 2010 was uh, was Mickelson, was it? Correct. 2009 yes. is a good one. Was Cabrera? Correct. 2008. Okay, I, I think remember, we know. I, I don't think remember. We know eight. 20, 2007 was Zach Johnson. Correct. And Tiger was 2000. No, oh, no, 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 no. It was Mickelson. Correct. Tiger was. And Tiger won in 05. Yes. yes. And 04. A four was also Mickelson. Correct. Two thousand. That was when he jumped. That was when he jumped this high off the ground. This high. That putt. Yes. Two thousand three <laughs> was the first of two lefties back to back to win. That's oh, Mike Weir. Mike Weir Correct. in the playoff. Two thousand two. We know. <sighs> yeah, Tiger. Tiger was two thousand two. Two thousand one. We know. Yeah, that was Tiger as well. Finishing the two slam. Two thousand was VJ. Correct. 99 was uh, You're doing well, by the way. Olathabel. I played in as an amateur in 99. Excellent. 98 uh, was the, the uh, 40 year old Marco Miri won two majors that year. Correct. Also, the Open at Birkdale. Uh, yes. not 97, we know, obviously. Oh, yeah. Tiger. What a win. Yeah. What a win. What a win. 90, 96. Oh, how can you forget 96? That was the Norman meltdown and, and Felder Correct. shooting 67. All right, you're good. You want to keep going? How far do you want to go? We're good. We're good. Uh, it's up to you. I mean, you know, you've helped me along a little bit. I've, I've forgotten to, I forgot two of my best friends this years, but other than yeah, that, I'm doing okay. Yeah, you're, you're in trouble <laughs> with them, but I've enjoyed the content. Uh, 95, very emotional. 90 yeah, that was Ben Crenshaw after Harvey Pennick died. Correct, Harvey, Harvey Pennick died. So, 94, yeah. we've already mentioned his name. Olathabo won his first Masters. Correct, 93, a repeat champion. Let's just think, Freddie won in 90, was it 91 or 92? 92 was Freddie. 92 well, was Freddie. 91 so, was Ian Woosnam. Correct. So, 93, repeat champion. Yes, a former Masters champion. The best German golfer not named Martin Keimer. Oh, it's Langer. He won in 85 and 93. Correct. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, How you did mentioned I Wusen. Langer. Uh, I still think Schwartzel is the one you're going to be <laughs> more, most regretful for. Hey, can, you not ed- can you not edit that out for me? <laughs> sure. On, hey, hey, <laughs> dude, let's edit that part out. Oh, they say no problem. We got it for you. Piece of cake. You We're guys, done. You guys are going to hang me out to dry on that one. All right, you're good. I'm going to text him now. I'm going to have to text him. We're, we're, we're done. We're good. We, we, we won't go any further. Well, listen, it's always good to talk to you. We chat a lot about the game when I have questions and you always respond. So it's great to catch up mm-hmm. with you. And again, I'm still so happy you won the damn tournament in 2008. <laughs> Thanks. It's been awesome to, uh, to join you and reminisce, man. It's really been great. Thanks a lot. All right, brother. Be well. Okay, cheers. So that'll do it for this episode of Half Forgotten History. Once again, our thanks to Trevor Immelman for playing along and going the extra mile as he did as we sort of embarrassed him for getting some of his friends who won the Masters. He might hear from them. I don't know. Well, maybe not. Now he probably will. But we'll be going the extra mile all year long thanks to our friends at Mercedes-Benz Sprinter Vans. And coming up next week on Half Forgotten History, a guy who got close at the Masters but did cross the finish line on a major at a different venue and a different major, the U.S. Open, a Ryder Cup player, a captain's pick, a President's Cup player, and a captain at the Ryder Cup. 
none other than the funkiest swing ever on tour, Jim Furyk. We'll see you next time.